Um, hey everyone, I'm really glad to be back again here and um, I'm with the exhibitions team. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Five of them. So I'm, I might just get you all to introduce yourselves and where you are. Hi, I'm Tim Barker. I'm the production manager at Biennale at Sydney and I'm here now in the Turbine Hall on Cockatoo Island. I was actually out here today doing some maintenance, so I'm out here. I'll pass over to Alex. I'm Alex Robinson, I'm the registrar, and I'm just next to Tim, just off the end of the Turbine Hall in Manuel Campo space. And to Jeremy. Hello, Jeremy here. Um, I am uh, the production manager of Cockatoo Island, so I work with Tim on the production for Cockatoo Island. I am um, currently virtually up on the top of Cockatoo Island with Tony Albert's work. Uh, hi, um, I'm Jess Hutchins. I'm uh, zooming in from Perth, Western Australia, where I'm holding up with my family for a while um, and sitting behind this artwork by Charlotte Allingham. Uh, I'm a curatorial assistant at the Biennale. And hi, I'm Belle Morgan, um, exhibition coordinator at the Biennale of Sydney. Um, yeah. And we'll be speaking a bit today about the uh, exhibition near and at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Yeah, thanks everyone. I mean, I think it's just so great to see behind the scenes. I'm sitting virtually in front of Iziz Hazara's work um, up in level three at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And you can see, you know, a 3D of his uh, work, um, a really great one at the um, Museum of Contemporary Art website. They've got this great 3D walkthrough. But one thing that I'm so excited about, um, it, you know, Niren being artist led and First Nations led, is that also the way in which that it's very collaborative too, where the artists are working with the whole exhibition team. And, you know, what does that mean? I mean, even when it comes to barging, to conservation, to, you know, working with uh, interventions to, oh, God, you know, how do you find, you know, like five chairs, for example, that an artist wants within, you know, four days. But, you know, something that I really wanted to kind of start off with is really to talk about Niran Ney. Whoops, Niran Ney. Look at that virtual kind of flipping out there. Um, and I know, Jess, you were like one of the strong editors on, on this book and, you know, we've had a, a chat with um, Trent and Stuart in the last, uh, you know, um, conversation. And it'd be really great to hear your thoughts about, about Nira Name. You know, I know that we work very closely on that. You're working very furiously behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. So Nira Nay, I think it sort of started out more as this idea of a reader, which is something lots of biennales have done, but we wanted it to be quite different from a kind of, you know, just an academic tome. Um, and I initially started with this idea of expanding upon Brooke some of your themes for the exhibition, which is so dynamic, but which we thought could use, you know, some fleshing out in this book format. But then as um, we got more and more artists on board as part of the exhibition, we realized that so many of them have such interesting kind of writing practices or use text and image in their work, or just have these things that would be really fantastic in a book format. And it kind of became this artist book project, Brooke, is, is that, Kind of how you feel it sort of evolved over time to become this you know fantastic artist book and then um Stuart and Trent of course joined and in a way turned the book into an artist and an artwork in itself um you can see some pages here it's really dynamic they you know worked they've got this great ring binding for the book so that um and bought their own print offset printer to produce it I guess you kind of have covered a lot of this but um, really worked on each individual piece by each artist um, individually so that, you know, the design and the colour and the printing kind of reflects, you know, the actual artwork. Um, and still we have like a lot of the themes of Niran um, in the background here is um, a piece we commissioned by Charlotte Allingham, who goes under Coffin Birth on Instagram, who does these amazing kind of graphic um, depictions of Indigenous life and protest and she covered each of the seven themes of Niran including behind me here which is sort of sovereignty and looking at ideas of protest and I think um, different works sort of reflect different themes from the environment to food Andrew Rewold's Re piece which he collaborated on with Tennant Creek so you've got these you know extra pieces that kind of flesh out some of those themes in a very different way from the exhibition. Um, yeah I was wondering if you could talk a little bit because I know that we spoke so much about um, 
uh, the Copyright Council and, you know, we commissioned a few pieces as well. I um, mean, also, of course, it was a, a, you know, a, a really big collaboration with Aesop as well. But um, with Charlotte's work, I mean, that was definitely uh, a commission. Yeah, so um, I think another really great thing about the reader is we got to work with lots of different types of pieces. We didn't, um, you know, create any kind of demarcation. We got to commission new works with the help of a copyright um, a council grant, um, as well as um, looked at existing pieces by people um, that we thought, like Stephen Gilchrist had a piece that had been published in Artlink which, about public monuments, which we thought would really tie in really well with some of the other pieces. Um, and we also used works that people were already making as part of the exhibition because there are text works in the exhibition. So Carla Dickens has these amazing collages, which kind of informed her work at the art gallery, and wrote this poem, but she has this practice where she has poetry about her in art. Um, but in terms of the new commissions, as yeah, as I've already mentioned, Charlotte Allingham did these seven new illustrations on the theme of Niren. Um, First Dog on the Moon, who's a you know well-known political cartoonist in Australia, made us um, some new pieces about colonialism. Um, and you know, then we had some great pieces which kind of em emerged quite organically. Um, a couple of the guys from Tennant Creek were down when we had one of our launches, and um, Joseph Williams, who previously hasn't published any writing, did this amazing talk when we were sort of meeting with the people at Art Space just about their work in Tennant Creek, and then we asked him to write something, and he ended up writing it with another um, Tennant Creek member, Jimmy Frank, and they wrote this just like beautiful, harrowing piece and very hopeful piece about like life in Tennant Creek and what creati creativity means to them, and and. Um, and, and translated it into language and produced this piece that sort of comes from um, language which is sort of disappearing, which they're actively trying to um, hold on to. So, yeah, we got some amazing stuff out of the, those kind of organic processes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jess. Hey, Tim, I'm just wondering, you know, with um, Ibrahim's work, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that, because, I mean, you know, even kind of reflecting on Nearing Nay, um, you know, the, the kind of reader artist book, there was a lot of collaboration and, you know, that's a big work. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is, um, the turbine hill is always a really difficult place to fill, but I've, I've never seen it tackled quite like this. And I mean, it looks incredible in here, but it's, I mean, the, one of the things I really love about this work is the story of all the sacks, where they've all come from, the life they've all, all had. They come from all over Africa and then they're all brought together and stitched together into these other pieces to get brought back together into an even bigger pieces and get stitched up all over the turbine hall. But the collaboration was huge and we didn't have a lot of time to plan for it either because it was moved from another site quite late on. So all of a sudden we, we had, I think, you know, a, two or three weeks to really pull together how we were going to get the work to the island, how we were going to rig it and get it signed off by engineers, um, what the methodology was to then raise it up into the air because the pieces are all pretty heavy. They're all 18 metres by five metres. Could you just show us around a little bit? Yeah, sure. Of course, yeah. I'll, I'll, it's a bit glary down the end, which is why I've got it over to the side, but I'm about halfway down so you can see the scale. And um, the, I mean, the height is of the tower. I'll tilt back a little bit as well. So it'll get a bit bright though. But, but yeah, you can sort of see the scale there. So there was two, two really large machines in here to hoist it all up. I think a team of six people spent three weeks unfolding, sewing, prepping all the pieces because a lot of the pieces came, unfortunately got wet in the container on the way as well. So they weren't usable. So we then had one frantic day where we went and collected another 2,000 sacks from Sydney. But I think you can see that the seed of dark colours, the, the new ones we got didn't look like they would work anyway. So then there was this whole, how can we dye them? But I think they've been used for so long in their life that so that's why they've got this kind of dark, sort of degraded model tone. But yeah, it's, it's um, quite an incredible work. It's amazing. So, so I was wondering, Alex and, and Jeremy, you're like really on the ground there in the island too. I mean, what was that like, that energy... Um, before we get to, you know, speaking about your, your own, you know, works that you're sitting in front of. Um, I mean, it was, it was pretty epic when we first, is my, um, is my uh, video coming up? Yes, yes. it is. It is, cool. Um, yeah, it was pretty epic. Um, we had a can, two large trucks. I mean, we thought we'd fit it all in one, one big, what, 16 ton truck, I think it was. Um, and then that came, but uh, GSS, um, Alex worked with GSS to get the, get the work here uh, to, to the island. And it didn't fit in there, so we had to get another whole truck in. Um, and we had six crew who I think very quickly realised the enormity of what they 
of what they <laughs> what they had undertaken and what they had been assigned to do. Um, and yeah, so they started to unroll it and bit by bit, um, just stitch together five by five meter pieces, stitch them together with um, jute twine um, by hand on the ground. They put their headphones in a lot of them and just spend days and days and days and days doing that. Um, you know, it's a, it was, it was a hard and grueling job for them. I think they, they, as it went on, um, people started to feel a sense of ownership over it and really started to see what was, what they were contributing to and what it was going to become. And um, people got really enthusiastic about it. But those first few days, people were going, what is this? <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm going there and, um, you know, the, some of the, like some of the workers, but also some of the volunteers and they were like, super pumped and i'm actually trying to find yep. some photos on my phone where they're like posing in front of it and of course you know this, this is one thing about like big projects like this when you have to work very fast but as i also i imagine there's a bit of anxiety especially when like some pieces were moldy alex and I'm, i mean you know the cockatoo island itself in the turbine hall and it's full of pigeons it's full of you know all sorts of conditions and i know tim that you've had to kind of you know work a lot you know very closely to um you know around health and safety like all of you have and I was just wondering if you could like maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how, like how do you have a painting? Yeah, so kind of backtracking a little bit to back to Ibrahim's uh, installation. So all the all the jute was shipped in a container, a 40 foot container that came from Italy. And actually, I might just walk down the end of the corridor and join Tim down there in the um, turbine. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, wow. uh, so yeah, it, it arrived and some of it had been packed wet and then had been on the sea for two months essentially and had gone really moldy. So unfortunately, like a, quite a bit of it got discarded. Um, but it was, basically all the jute was palletized and that was the, the issue was we could have brought a container onto the island and dumped it there directly, but it would have been a bit cost prohibitive. So we decided to un unload the jute pallets from the container and then load them on a semi and bring them on in two different loads. Um, and luckily, it all got here around the same time as Francis, who is Ibrahim's assistant. Mm. Um, and and then the team were there, and everything was um, it was kind of all all guns blaring. Um, and it's a really great outcome as well. I mean, it's just quite extraordinary that there was finally enough jute. Yeah, well, it was it was almost perfectly exactly the right amount for the turbine hall that's why we had to go out and get some more because we weren't sure if it would fit um but this particular jute had come from his gallery in italy so i think this had been used on a building this might have been used on the venice building i think last year or the year before um yeah and what about like um uh for example um manuel campos you know, works in paintings. I mean, how do you deal with paintings in a very open space? Because maybe if you could, you know, the three of you could maybe just talk about the kind of animals and kind of uh, conditions that are happening in an exciting place like Cockatoo Island. Yeah, so so kind of with Manuel's work, that on the island, there aren't too many works that we install that are kind of considered fragile or kind of susceptible to environmental conditions because basically it's, humid, it's damp, we can't really control the environments and there are lots of birds. Um, so in terms of these paintings here, I just feel like that, that we've installed. Um, the other thing is it's a heritage site. So we're not allowed to drill into the walls or anything like that. So we use different methodology to hang each different painting essentially, uh, including kind of hanging wire, uh, pressure fitting posts behind clamping, things like that. So everything is completely reversible to protect the heritage of the site. Uh, and then in terms of the placement, we can kind of look at the, the birds there seem to find their good nesting spots. And you can tell because of all the, all the shit they leave on the ground. So basically when, when we're kind of looking at where we're going to install these with Brook, we kind of had to look at where the dirtiest places were and they're the places we know not to install work. We kind of got an idea because it started to rain in January. So we kind of got an idea of where leaks were in the roof as well. And we could kind of work around that. And basically Tim and Jeremy were there kind of practically living on the island. So I guess they could talk a little bit about the environment. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in terms of 
put installing an exhibition it's pretty much the worst environment you can use i mean it's or it goes against all of the rules there's no climate control there's no controlled environments it's humid like you've already touched on the birds there's rats the sea it's also the island is also a seagull breeding site so luckily it was a quiet year for that but sometimes that you have to deal with thousands of seagulls as well which are quite aggressive and then they take over everywhere as well inside the buildings and outside the buildings so it's a, it's a challenge to try and keep them off artworks and i think alex already said we, we generally veer away from putting fragile works out here but um it's it, they do, they, there is a beautiful juxtaposition when you have those kind of more delicate paintings out here in this in, industrial environment as well but I, like alex said you pick your spots based on where they're nesting or where they're where, where they're living but it's yeah, that, it, yeah. oh i was just going to say that uh this year there was quite a lot of um quite a lot of extreme weather events as well. Um, we had the bushfires, uh, which were, you know, quite tragic bushfires um, up in the Blue Mountains. And there was a huge amount of smoke coming through and they're not sealed environments. So we were, we were, there was a lot of exposure to smoke. And then, so we had to shut down one day because of heat and smoke. And then it seemed like only a week later, um, there was a massive storm with high winds. And it's finally like, we were hoping that it would rain so we'd find out where the leaks were and it definitely showed us where the leaks were so you know there was we went around that next that next morning and uh, we actually told the crew not to come in because there was some damage and we went around and just documented where all the major leaks were um, and then that informed placement of the more fragile artworks um, so yeah it was it's a, it's a challenging um, environment to work in but as yeah as Tim said it's also the what makes it such an epic amazing um, environment to work in yeah and I can see that um, Jeremy is, you've got a slide up behind you with of Lola Amira's work as South African artist uh, what was that like I mean I know Tim you're also installing that work and, and Alex um, in conservation because one of the works um, came with a little bit of damage but you, you had a conservation set up on the island, um, but it's also, I mean, how important is conservation out in a site like that? Yeah, um, so we have two kind of freelance conservators working with this and they were there for three weeks full time, I think, just the last three weeks of install, which is kind of the crunch time when everything's kind of happening simultaneously. So we're kind of spread fairly thin. Um, basically, like each project has its, you kind of, writing your own set of rules for each different project and you have to kind of adapt to the artist needs how fragile the work is how protective they are of the work as well so for instance like um yeah so the works which was shipped, so for instance behind me now is jose de villa one of his installations and he was working with found objects from cockatoo island and what we did was actually a lot of fabrication on the island um so all of these kind of cement plinths, we, we had a workshop, full workshop set up so we could fabricate all those. Um, and in, in that kind of situation, conservation's not that critical, but in other works like Manuel's or down in the powerhouse, we had Anna Bohegian. And th th those are really kind of high value works that are very fragile, quite precious. So we, we kind of just have to kind of prioritize everything, I guess. Yeah, and Jess, I know that you worked with um, um, uh, uh, with the Kashmir um, artists, the photographers, um, and they had two sites. They had at Campbelltown Art Centre, but also at Cockatoo Island. I know that. Was that Tim? That did you work with them as well, or was it Jeremy? And both of you? Uh, I, I I did a bit of work with them as well. Just kind of yeah, uh, behind me now is Campbelltown. Um, so yeah, J Jess was kind of, I only started in August. So Jess was kind of the main point of contact prior cause she's your the curatorial assistant to, to Brooke. Um, so with Sanjay, that's another example where he was very particular about the kind of printing he wanted and having control of the quality of the images. So he preferred to print the all the photographs in india and have them shipped out which is fine um but other 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 artists for instance would kind of delegate that to ask and, and we could like print exhibition copies here and what was that like jess i mean because you also work with archery nepal 
Yeah, so both of those um, projects, I think, started um, with with Kashmiri artist Eileen Sanjay's, um, who, who kind of was a facilitator of that project. It's actually nine Kashmiri photojournalists um, who he worked with um, as an editor of a book called Witness. And I'd seen the book and seen his film in London. And Brooke, you were very interested in Kashmir as well and, and highlighting the ongoing conflict there, which is not much in Australian media. So I think it was really important that we, we um, you know, found this amazing collective of photographers and that fit in really well, I think, especially at Campbelltown with all these different approaches to photography and photojournalism that were happening there. And I think what's really dynamic and, and as, as Alex said, like Sanjay um, was very particular about how he wanted things, but in the end, we got so many different kind of versions of what photojournalism can be, which is, um, you know, the, the large scale public monuments at Cockatoo Island down to this sort of historic, historical kind of like um, at Campbelltown. Um, then with Art Trina Paul, that was another group that we came across because um, Hitman, um, one of the members was um, visiting Sydney and we, um, you know, got acquainted with this incredible collective um, who were all Indigenous Nepalese artists. And again, I think, Brooke, it was about, from your perspective, highlighting these places um, which are quite marginalised and, and these conflicts which aren't much known about. So Art Trina Paul made work about the kind of corrupt medical industry in Nepal and you know we're all familiar with how, just how much sort of these ideas around eastern medicine and 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 you know the particular like romanticism around Nepal has infiltrated western culture but the effects on the ground are that their health system is incredibly unequal and yeah. there's been this complete dominance of the western kind of view um, yeah and that was one of the beautiful things about working with you too Jess I mean just the way in which that you really had your finger on the pulse with you know, those uh, collectives that really kind of brought to the forefront. And and it was kind of interesting about how it is that Artri Nepal had their installation, which is really very delicate. I mean, it's, it's gold foil, it's, you know, kind of opening up a, you know, a medicine, you know, showing medicines, like raw forms of medicine. I know that Alex Tory, your assistant, you know, and, um, you know, she, she worked on many other aspects of the Biennale, um, you know, we're kind of trying to access these kind of herbs as well. But Tim, I know that you and Jeremy were working very closely on that project as well. But also how we worked with um, the, you know, the Kashmiri um, artists to how, how is it that you get a massive, like, you know, eight by 15 meter kind of, you know, billboard image out there on an incredibly windy site. And I know that we really cranked through a few ideas. Yeah, so I mean, there was, there was several different placements for that when I first sort of came on and started finding it. And, and we just couldn't find a suitable one because putting large, large format prints outside, they're, they're basically big sales. So you need a lot of ballast or you need to have something that's drilled into the ground. Um, but then I remember walking out there one day with you, Brooke, and we got off the ferry and you just saw the structures over on the left-hand side of the apron. So they obviously are ballasted, they're permanent structures, but they're, and they're perfect frames for the works as well. But still, you have to print onto a mesh. You can't print onto a vinyl or anything like that because it's still, the wind will catch it. It's on a high, really high windy site. So that, that, that's always a bit of a challenge. I know that in the past, some artists have shied away from installing large works out here because they feel that the, um, the mesh can compromise the work. But it looks great. Like I, the images look so sharp and so great. And they look, they look, they look amazing at night when they're lit from behind as well. Um, so yeah, I was really, I was really glad that Sanjay decided to go ahead. And that was one where he let us lead on that a little bit. He just sort of said, okay, you guys know what you're doing out there. And, and then we, we measured up the sites. They're quite unusual, um, formats to them. They're very long thin images. So he spent a bit of time sort of pitching things together for that. And then, um, basically, yeah, he let, he left that up to us to print, print that. And they, they came out amazingly well. They came out really well. Yeah. Alex. Alex. Look at that. I mean, they're very important images, and I, you know, I think that the way in which that we used the kind of the built environment and the structure was really important. I, do, I remember me talking a lot to the exhibition team about not having a plinth. I don't have a plinth, like a classical plinth anywhere, unless it's artist-driven, like, for example, Jose de Villa working with the great team there to create those kind of concrete plinths. But Jeremy, I'm just wondering if you could um, really hankering to get over to Bell and talk about interventions and all of that in a minute. But I'm just wondering if you could maybe um, talk a little bit about Eric Bridgman's um, and House CRL's project. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that uh, Bell can probably feed into this as well. Um, 
Uh, Eric is an artist from Queensland and Papua New Guinea. Um, and uh, he's, one of his artworks, he had a number at the Biennale, but one was building a uh, traditional Papua New Guinean house. Um, and he was really happy, as we looked into the different options of how this house would be built, um, we're looking into traditional building techniques and it became clear that it was going to be difficult to, um, in the time that we had, to build with using traditional methods and get engineering sign off in such a high wind area as the Eastern Apron um, uh, on Cockatoo Island. So we had to turn around and look at other ways to do it. Um, so we came up with this and this is, um, if you look behind me, um, you'll see that there is a, a nine meter diameter truss cylinder. Um, and we use that as the base structure and using this, um, we were able to, we got this custom built in China um, brought over here and using this we were able to create a structure that um, custom built that could be ballasted that was able to be put out on the site for three months. Um, now this is something about yeah about working on Cockatoo Island it's like we do a pop-up art institution um, that needs every resource that an art institution would need like you need art you need an office you need a fully equipped workshop you need all of the access equipment um, you need staff, you need everything. So it, this was all coming together here and we got a couple of great um, installers. Dave Statham led this. And um, for two months, this was getting built. And I'll just um, show you as the evolution of this. This was inside building 140. Um, there were some challenges um, because uh, Sail GP is a massive sailing event. Um, that was happening on the Eastern Apron on Cockatoo Island um, during the first, basically during our whole install period. So we had to share the island. So this, we had to build this structure inside and make it modular. So then we could then take it down and rebuild it in five days. But, but was that okay in a way, in a way, because Eric's kind of concept for his house era is to, Kind of live on and kind of travel anyway so it was a very long process of kind of like how do you put it together and then pull it apart pack it up put it in a kind of storage container a big shipping container you know, like a travel in yeah it's ended up it's ended up working really well and it's quite a tidy package so i'll just show you what it ended up where it ended up going so there's a container that's part of it that's an audio visual installation shows some films that he has made and then there in the background is the is the house and that packs down into the container that is has the audio visual installation in it no, and i have i have a, I have a picture here um oh damn it's not going to come up now it's you installing whoop oh, hang on <laughs> <laughs> look at that inside so to get up there i've got lots of go i got photos of everyone in here <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the installation of, I mean, it looks just really beautiful and that's something that obviously the BNL is not open at the moment, but there are certain structures that you can leave up. And I know that Tim and Alex, um, you've been kind of going around the island. Yeah, so we, we come out once or twice a week because there's still, there's a lot of plant life involved in some of the installations and we are really, really hopeful we'll be able to have. Whoops. Tim's got, anyway, I think Tim was saying that we are really hopeful that we'll have another moment and we'll be able to reopen soon. So basically we've put the show into hibernation. So all the fragile things have kind of come down and we've got them securely stored away, but some of the bigger structures where, where, where we've left there, if they can kind of deal with the weather and the, the conditions. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of plant life. So we have to kind of water things a few times a week and, um, yeah, sorry, Tim, you cut out there if you want to jump back in. No, no, it's all right. You carry on. That's... Oh, I want to hear from you, Tim. <laughs> um, I'll just start again. Um, so basically, just saying we come out once a week or so. I think Alex just alluded to it. There's lots of plant life to look after. We're really hoping that we can reopen. So we're maintaining everything as best as we can to make sure that it's all in really good condition still. Um, but yeah, Eric's, Eric's, Eric's structure is looking like it did the day it went up. It's looking great. And it's... it's really beautiful setting out there on the grass. 
the grass is actually coming back really well. It got quite damaged in the, um, the install for Cell GP. It was very muddy. So it was a bit of a shame that the ground wasn't looking great, but it's looking really good again now. So I'm hoping that when we do reopen, it'll be, it'll be really beautiful for everyone. So if we kind of like fast forward over to the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which is, you know, the first, you know, Australian, um, you know, was a British colony um, built gallery. Um, and Belle, I know that, you know, you were the kind of the contact and the main kind of exhibition, um, you know, person on the ground over there, as well as the National Art School as well. But I mean, I really want to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, intervention. What is a museum intervention? How is it that, for example, there are artists who are working with the collection itself. And, uh, you know, of course, with the Art Gallery in New South Wales, we have Alicura, the Chilean Mapuche poets, you know, on the facade of the Art Gallery in New South Wales. And we have Carla Dickens, who's, you know, a Wiradjuri Australian artist in the vestibule. And then you have, Mike, you know, Kumana Mike Williams, in, you know, in the foyer with Barbara McGrady and Mooka Project and um, Sammy Bologi as well. But then you actually enter into the old court galleries. And I'm just wondering, you know, could you maybe just describe what that is? Yeah, well, I guess um, the old court galleries are, you know, the, um, I guess, uh, 17th to 19th century galleries where European and international and Australian uh, works are housed. So they're kind of traditional galleries, as you might imagine, as we have in most of the state institutions in Australia. And I think, Brooke, this was like one of your earliest uh, visions that I remember hearing about Thaniran. Um and I know you had very early conversations with um, Michael Brand, who's the director as, at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, as well as with um, Maud Page and the curators there around this intervention where contemporary works would actually intervene in the spaces where the Art Gallery's collection and um, yeah, is. And so this is obviously, you know, conversations that needed to start very early on, given institutions' obligation to the works and to all the stakeholders that they they deal with. So, I think it's amazing what you know. We're just having a laugh here, everyone, because Alex has got a picture up. But we, Alex, you need to speak so we can. Yeah, I know. I, I'm just gonna let go. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> For, it, for showing the photo. So um, Alex has just put it up an image here um, of the of court nine, which is one of the first courts that you enter when you're into the art gallery, um, which shows the intervention. And you can see here that um, Brooke has, um, yeah, working very closely with the art gallery team and curators there um, has, uh, you see Emily Caracas painting. Emily's an amazing Maori artist and land rights activist who's extremely, you know, been at the forefront of the land rights movement in New Zealand, in particular the Ihamato dispute, which is ongoing, and her work, which is about this, is right here in amongst the uh, Australian uh, symbolist works. And then you have um, these other sculptures of Karim Le, which are around, uh, mixed in here with the neoclassical neo bronzes. Yeah, and and off to the right is also um, Mostaf Machuaya from Zimbabwe. Oh, yeah. I think that's who, who on the right. Yeah, Alex, maybe um, just so we can have to see a little bit more of that image, if you could maybe talk a little bit about the, like the conservation considerations and receiving the works of um, uh, Karem, uh, Mustaf, and also Emily. Yep. So, so basically with so for the biennale we're at six different sites six different venues and we do handovers to all the other exhibition partners um except for basically cocktail island which we manage that site ourselves um so all the kind of conservation and those kind of issues kind of dealt with in-house by the art gallery here in terms of kind of getting work here so karim's sculptures came from haiti um, so basically everything that leaves Haiti is fumigated and that's kind of one requirement because it's organic material. So they're made of recycled wood and metal. Um, so they, they get fumigated on the way out and the, the conservation team from the art gallery inspect everything before they actually take it into their site because they don't want any contamination. Um, so for, for Emily Caracas painting, so she's just over in Auckland. So she did all of her paintings during a residency 
uh, over the Christmas break last year. So that was kind of December 2019 through to January 2020. And, and that's then, a very, very bright. I just want to say it's a very bright painting that you see there. Yeah, that's a very bright painting on the left, um, just left of center. Um, so she did six paintings and we, because she just painted them, we were able to roll them all and, and send them consolidated shipment in, in one tube. And then they all got stretched here in Australia. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, Bell, I remember, you know, even our first early meetings, we met with lots of different curators. I remember Peter Racis, who's, mm -hmm. um, you know, looks after the kind of more early Renaissance paintings, was like super excited to have artists like Brazilian artists, like, you know, um, Rosanna Paulino, and also, you know, even, um, you know. Uh, Roman Katz. Yes, Roman Katz from South Africa, Ami Joel from Madagascar, Paris. I mean, you know, like so many different artists. He was like really excited about the fact that artists would be kind of juxtaposing coming in, working with, with you know, that. And also um, the way in which, for example, uh, like Nicholas Galanin's, you know, two big video works were hanging in the space and Joseph Gargarica's work as well. That's yeah. Nicholas's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hold it up. Maybe you could hold it up and talk a little bit about that structure. Yeah, so, so here you see um, the work by Nicholas Galan, and this is Suheide Shugaks Tuktan. And um, this is a video work, which is in two parts. And um, so part of your vision, Brooke, was that the two parts would hang suspended amongst the old court um, galleries or in, you know, amongst the works in there. And so it was, it was, it is this call and response where you have part one and part two playing to each other. Um, and the, the films have two different soundtracks. So um, one is a traditional, you know, Klingit soundtrack uh, and song. And then the other one is an electro dub soundtrack. So it's really brought so much dynamism into this space, which traditionally is kind of, you're told to be told to maybe be quiet in, um, you know, not, not that, um, yeah. So it's, it's really, I guess the art gallery, uh, were really excited about this, as you mentioned, um, Peter Racis. And I remember, um, Anne Ryan, who was the curator of Australian art as well as, you know, Isabel Parker Phillip, who's the curator of, um, Australian contemporary art there, you know, everyone was so excited by the possibilities of bringing these really, dynamic contemporary works into the space and about the conversation they would there would be um, with the collection works and yeah went above and beyond to work out how to do that as you can see this works hanging in the space so they we actually had to go up on the roof to uh, multiple times to work out um, you know with the art gallery's amazing install team their head of, head of install um, yeah, Nick, he's, you know, incredible at um, problem solving. And so it was a really close relationship working with the art gallery to achieve um, the artist vision and, and your vision for Niren. Yeah, I mean, especially when you have people who love a painting and, um, you know, the old court galleries is mainly made up of painting and, and more kind of a traditional Western sculpture. Uh, but one thing about this is, of course, working very closely with the artists and, you know, when some of the artists couldn't be there, I know Joelle was there, and um, I know that Barbara McGrady came in a few times, uh, you know, and some of the other artists because they were in Sydney or they visited specifically for, you know, uh, for this uh, visit. I know that Arthur Jacker also did come in who ended up being in the Schaefer Gallery, you know, in that kind of incredible space where you've got the Queen of Sheba pa painting and yet he, his white album was there. Mm -hmm. um, and also Joseph Gargarig, I might just quickly show, oh, if I can, I tend to love her. Uh, 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 that, so that's it. That's it there. It's in black and white. Um, I'm playing a game here. Can't really see it. But Alex, maybe you can talk a little bit about it because it's sitting on top of your head. Yeah. Um, so this is Gregory Gregor's work from the 90, it's, I think the period was 1972 to 74 or 5. Um, so it's a work that um, he showed he would always show them in churches and cathedrals um, in, in Europe. He, um, so this was a work which I guess uh, Brooke knew about. And it was, it's kind of, I, I'd say it's one of the key moments in, in the show. Um, and yeah, logistically it, it came from Barcelona. 
Um, there are actually two components for the work. One, the actual central piece is owned by a, a cathedral in Barcelona. So yes. they borrow that from the, the cathedral. And then the rest of the components are all from uh, the artist estate that's um, run by the artist's daughter. Yeah, so Esther came over and, you know, she's just so incredible. And again, you know, like that kind of uh, the team of volunteers and also experts, you know, working with Ibrahim and other artists work, really did work cl quite closely with Esther. There's a fantastic, you know, image of Esther, um, you know, working. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Look at that. I mean, and it's just really fantastic the way in which that... Um, you know, all the artists had an opportunity to kind of really work on the ground, work with these interventions. And of course, you know, as you said, um, Isabel, the curator at Art Gallery New South Wales is incredibly important and also their conservation team and their installation team to really kind of like open up that space. Because often, you know, I mean, these spaces, even though they're very grand and they're huge spaces that are made for doing painting and to kind of have these kind of larger scaffolding. I mean, this was a really big discussion always in our um, meetings um, about scaffolding. Tim. I mean, it's something I was about to jump in there, but it's something I really like about this exhibition is there's not much traditional furniture or wall build or any of those sort of usual. It, I, think there's, I think we built one plinth out here on the island that's got a kind of traditional glass top. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's scaffolding everywhere. We used a lot of scaffolding, I think. I mean, we already had, I think, a thousand meters of it in storage out here, and we had to buy more because so much it's used so much for rigging, for hanging artworks. So, but I really love the way that um, the art gallery allowed to open up that space to put that kind of raw scaffolding structure right in the center, all those very fine, grand artworks. I mean, it's it's, it's good of them to do that. It's, I think there would have been a lot of discussion around that that, that would have happened to to get to that point where they were happy with allowing those kind of structures into their spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, Jess, I know that both you and Belle work quite closely with Ernie um, Barb as well. And I just thought maybe if you wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the work that, you know, she was doing with John. Uh, yeah, so um, Barbara McGrady is this like prominent um, photojournalist in Sydney. Um, but I think Brooke is probably one of the first people to really showcase her work at this other level as, as art, although she has had exhibitions in the past. Um, and she made this incredible work. I think the idea was, Brooke, really from your perspective, to, to try to understand this dense, dense archive that she has, just really like covering all of, you know, every aspect of Indigenous life and Australian life in Sydney over decades. And how do you show that kind of uh, massive archive of somebody? And, and how do you make it fun and accessible and, and dynamic? Um, and so she worked with a filmmaker, John Jansen Moore, who had previously worked with her film about her career and they created this massive installation that kind of of projections that go through the archive and he also um, took a lot of her words that she's using you know on Facebook she's very active on social media she's very active in politics so it kind of juxtaposes her words and her images and put them to this amazing kind of really you know pumping soundtrack and filled this entire space and I'd say for me it's one of the most impactful works in the show I, I cried the first time I saw it just because you know it's about racism it's about all these really intense issues that she's covered but it's full of like hope and joy and it's really accessible so yeah mm -hmm. it was such a privilege working with her um, and at a time when she's also been quite unwell and she had to publicly kind of retire. And so I think for her to have this moment where she could work on things from home because she can't do that kind of active photojournalism anymore, that's been really, really important. And that will live on as a, as a video work. Yeah. And um, Belle, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about Teresa Morgolos, because, um, you know, talking about like, you know, Often artists land in a you know in a city when they're doing the Biennale, and we literally didn't know what Teresa was going to do. And you know because this is often some of the artists work like this. They need to be in a space. They need to kind of feel you know the you know like she had an idea, but like you know it was really just about like and there's a picture here again. It's invisible. Well, I'm just wondering if we could show page 34 and 35 of the catalog. Um, Yeah, so that's, there's some scaffolding, but that didn't end up staying. See Teresa. Yeah, and then also, um, if you go to page, um, I love this, go to page 54. 54. 52. Oh, yeah. 
So these are um, volunteers that um, Teresa Morgolis and her team worked with to go to certain sites um, out in uh, Sydney to kind of, I suppose, uh, soak up the essence of places where there's femicide, where there's been murder of women. And maybe, Belle, if you could talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, I mean, as you said, Brooke, um, it was with Teresa, the project was, I guess... Can you um, share again? Because oh. um, it doesn't come up when you... Yeah. So, um, you know, Teresa turned up at the airport. We weren't sure when she was coming until the very last minute. Um, and even right up until her very arrival, it was very mysterious. And I have to say that I was waiting at the airport gates with her sister, Margarita, who came with her um, and works very closely with her. They have a small team that work very closely together on the project, about four people. And, um, you know, um, Teresa turned up at the airport and she was actually standing behind us. So, you know, I think for me that really epitomized, you know, it's, she is, um, you know, unpredictable, but this is her, the way that she works. Um, she is very present in the space and she turned up and worked extremely closely with our head of exhibitions, Cherie Schweitzer, and with Olivia Sophia, who's the curator at the National Art School, as well as Tim Andrews, who's on the install team there, and NAS volunteers on this project where um, they set off around Sydney, um, sponging the sites of um, yeah, where um, violent crimes had happened against women. And you can see um, on an earlier page in the catalogue the buckets which have the names of those women. So it was incredible to see Teresa's practice in action and um, yeah, to see it, a project turned around within a number of weeks um, with, as you can see behind Alex, the installation at the National Art School on the entire top floor, um, which is an incredible um, um, tribute to all of those women. Yeah, I, I think it was like, I think from the day she landed to the day it opened, it was about two weeks. And I remember talking to Tim, the installer out at National Art School, and like literally they, we had no information from Teresa of what she wanted, like even like lead time of like ordering supplies or anything. So she turned up, she developed the idea and then it was like, make this thing. And then somehow they made this, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so in, in the center of the floor, there are these kind of steel plates that are kind of heated and water drips down from the ceiling and it, it kind of stains and rusts the steel plates. Um, and that's the kind of, that's the um, exhibition space she's made. I mean, it's like the same as Tanya Bruguera. I remember, you know, Tim having a meeting with you because, you know, Tanya's work um, was such a struggle um, in a very good way because how is it that you kind of talk about the immensity of people being murdered um, from a community level up to an activist level because of their dedication to, you know, the environment? And how is it that you kind of create a platform and get hold of a tattooist? And again, Cherie Schweitzer worked very closely with that. Yeah, I mean, de definitely big, big shout out to Cherie on that one. I mean, we were under an immense amount of pressure at that point because the installation's huge out here. And there was um, Tanya's work and also Paolo Nazareth's work, which we, we knew on the outset that we, we were going to get information very late. But still, it, was, it didn't, doesn't make it any easier at that point when you've got so many other installs happening at the same time. So it was really great that Cherie was able to step in and sort of take the lead on sourcing um, the various items that we needed for Tanya's work. Like we need, had to find a, like a, a tattooing table, we had to find, you know, sort of um, waste bins, specific types of waste bins, and then cr construct a platform um, to Tanya's. Tanya came over for one day, I think she was here for one day, and um, we discussed what she wanted to do. And luckily what she wanted, we kind of had a lot of those materials on hand because uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier, we have a full workshop out here, metal workshop, woodworking, carpentry, paint shop. Um, so it was luckily a lot of the materials we already had on hand. She was like, oh, you know, this is perfect. This is what I want to use. So we yeah. very, with Ed, drew up a design for the platform. And then it was actually sort of, it relates to um, the work Jeremy was talking about earlier, Eric's uh, house, Uriel. The installation site for Tanya's work was where that was being test built. So there was this dance at the very end of the install where we had to take, deconstruct Eric's work, move that, and then as soon as that was out of that space, move in, clean the space, and then start construction on Tanya's. So there was a lot of time pressure 
uh, but it all came together in the end. But it's, it, it, we, we knew it was coming, we planned for it, we had scheduled for all of those pressure points, but it's still, when it comes to delivery, it's everyone's pretty tired by that time as well. It's been a long install time, so. Yeah, but I mean, it's also kind of this kind of energy, isn't it? Like, I mean, you wouldn't get an artwork like that, like, you know, Tanya's work, like Therese's work, like even, you know, uh, Law, for example, Law Provol, who worked in the Dog Lake Tunnel. I mean, I know that speaking with her herself, she said she's never done anything so difficult before. Oh, yeah. You know? It's it's it is totally like it's 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 really important to have that creative process and to collaborate. Everyone collaborates. All of the installers, the fabricators, us as production managers, the artists and their teams, and then you all just come together and make things happen. You have to move very quickly, but it's it's exciting as well. It's great, and and often the best results come from that kind of work. I mean, I mean, yeah. talking about work in the tunnel, that was incredibly difficult to get through from a health and safety point of view, as well, because it's a long, thin, dark, slippery damp space and law wanted to make it very very dark and um and, you know with health and safety today it's 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 hard to push those boundaries but we managed to get a, an amazing result and that was yeah, also that was, that was one of my favorite kind of stories from the install was um because you know we're, we're working with like such diver like the, the crew of installers everyone's kind of amazing everyone's come from these really diverse backgrounds and then when law turned up she needed ceramics made <laughs> And then, so we took two people from the AV team who were installing video, who were both ceramicists. That so was like Sybil and Anna, and they went and made all of these ceramics at UNSW in like two days. And, and they are like, extraordinary. Um, they're so, so beautiful. They're amazing. I, and they're huge. Like they're, they're huge ceramics as well, Brooke. I mean, that, that was actually, it was even, you were even involved in that whole production process at that point on the level of finding us the studio space in the kiln. So it was, you know, everyone's just collaborating all the time to make things happen. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I'm just going to turn off my, um, don't you, I love, I love these kind of chats. There you go. I'm in my studio. Because I want to show you this. Because like this is in the reader, near in May, reader that Jess and I worked with Stuart and Trent on. And like even like Law's drawings, her very early drawing. I mean, that looks like the big ceramic piece that, was made except the one behind you alex is a, is a fish or a shark yeah or something um yeah. so it's really lovely to see the kind of process drawings and then um the, the final kind of thing i mean even anna borgaghi I mean, even though she was at monash university for many months you know working there at mada with a fantastic team of people um you know it was so great that she was there and then you know her sitting in the powerhouse you know, thinking where does her work, you know, where does it sit? Like how, like so, so to actually have the artist kind of sitting there for a long time, I think that a lot of the public who come and see Biennales don't really see but that behind the scenes either. So you're kind of like getting really close with artists as well. I think out on Cockatoo Island particularly because the buildings are so sort of post-industrial and they're epic, they're huge. It's a struggle to hold those spaces. And I've never, there's a lot of pieces this in this edition that, like Annabelle Hagman, you were saying, just then I was thinking how well that, that piece sits in the space and it dominates the building. Whereas it's so hard to do that. So many other pieces have tried in the past to, to, to um, fight with the, the architecture that's there, but and they often don't work. But hers, hers is amazing. I think as well, Ibrahim's work, it just, it, again, it takes over the space and it fills it. And it, there's, um, there's, uh, there's several examples. Law, Law's work in the tunnel also. It's, 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 it's pretty incredible to work with artists who can see a space like that and then work with it so well. And that's the same with Tanya Bruguera. I remember, you know, she loved the enormity of that space that comes second turbine hall, so to speak, with this, this kind of really beautiful, intimate work where you're yeah. going through, you know, the kind of the, you know, the cards of the people who've died and you kind of pick one and you get like an inkless tattoo. But Jeremy, I see that you've got um, uh, uh, Muhammad Barissa's work up behind you. Yes, yeah. So um, Muhammad um, Barissa, is from Algeria. He's an artist who came over um, and did this amazing installation up in the, on the top of the island uh, in building six. Um, he, yeah, he carpeted the whole ground yellow um, and his, he wanted eight plants positioned around the room. Um, and each of these plants uh, were acacia and I think there were eucalypts as well. And so, in Algeria, as a, as a kid, he grew up with acacias around him, thinking that they were um, from Algeria, and then found out later they were from Australia. And this was 
he was speaking to the cultural connections around the world and his identity, I believe. Um, and also in representing that transmission of meaning, he um, got these electrodes that picked up the sound of the trees and little microphones were on these trees and they all got put up through an algorithm that they had written up to these speakers and there was a surround sound immersive audio piece. So as you walk in, you're listening to sounds that were triggered by the electrical impulses of the trees. And it created such a encompassing space once you got in there, the yellow was really uplifting and you walk in and you're hearing these trees sing mm. um, through these algorithms and sound, sound samples that were tirelessly programmed by Muhammad and his friend. Um, they were up there late until as late as they could be many nights in those last couple of weeks, um, just, just coding, coding, coding to uh, get the desired artistic outcome and sound they wanted. Yeah, and I know that Muhammad was also one of those artists, there were quite a few actually that came before the Biennale um, and went down and had a residency in London on and I remember the second day he was there, he was like, Brooke, I don't know if I can be here, you know, there are snakes and wombats and so much bush and then he ended up loving it and he met, he, he met up with MC Chronic, an, an Aboriginal Ewan man who's like a hip hop artist and also Nadine who's an Egyptian Australian you know, activist and sing songwriter, etc., and hip hop artist as well. And, you know, just the kind of music that he made. Um, but also, I kind of want to mention um, Rodney Raman and Hassan, who are Iranian artists based in Dubai. They came out, and this is an installation at the Powerhouse Museum, who was, um, you know, very much driving the Near and Weird program that Pascal Dantos Berry were really spearheaded. Um, and they worked for the first time with the entire collection of the Powerhouse Museum. Um, to create this this installation, and so that you know, really, it's kind of the Biennale was kind of also creeping into other sites, and, you know, and other public spaces as well. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any other things that you'd like to kind of think about. It'd be really nice to hear from all of you, just about like it could be a fun moment or. A, I don't know. It's just gonna... This is the only, this is another big project which he hasn't oh. really talked about and it I kind of deserves its own one. podcast. I think this one deserves to be spoken about. Yeah, <laughs> this one, I mean, what, Jeremy, when did we see this draw? I think, because this was an, originally, I mean, there's many iterations of what Vajiko Chachanyaki's work was going to be, but this was proposed to the gallery, this particular install, but because there's so much raw earth in there, they just they couldn't have that kind of contamination in the gallery space. So it shifted back to Cockatoo Island, I think, what, on the tw like the, the 20th of December or something like well, that? Well, actually, it was before that as well, because Vagico, like Nicholas Galanin, were a couple of those artists where the sites changed a little bit. And of yeah. course, Vagico's work was on the Eastern Apron, but it couldn't be there, you know, for another event that we were talking about before. And then it moved to the Art Gallery in South Wales, and then it moved back to, you know, the Cockatoo Island. But it's the perfect spot. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's yeah, Vagico, He was going to build this in the the entry court of the art gallery in New South Wales. And I remember when we when I started discussing it, when Bell and I started discussing it with Nick Reith over at the art gallery, he was just like, "What? Like, how how are you going to like? This is logistically impossible with the site." <laughs> and then I think Brooke made the decision, like, actually, let's move him back to the island, give him more space, and let him do what he needs to do and then he kind of really he, he's really kind of flexible and responded really well to all the changes and um and then the guy how i mean jeremy and tim can talk a bit about how long it took to fabricate this and how how many tons of compressed earth there is in it yeah, yeah. I mean, i'm just i'm just trying to look for a photo of the um the steel frame that's underneath this um i'll see if i can find it and bring it up in a bit um but we we looked at these these indicative drawings of how it was going to be built and um and we're thinking oh my god how how are we going to actually achieve this kind of overhung chunk of earth like a hand has got in this graveyard and pulled it out and just replaced it from the, the concept from china to um to sydney and Tim was, came, was like, well, we've got to do a rammed earth. We've got to do some sort of rammed earth. How are we going to do that? And at the last minute, we, uh, our friend um, Ed Horn, who was the workshop manager, who came on as workshop manager, we found out that he had just come from Peru and he had just done a rammed earth course. 
and he was an expert at round earth, um, which it couldn't have come to, together better. So that gave us, you know, the confidence to really push ahead with this, this build method. And, um, and Sarah, Sarah Betts came on who really led this and started to really nut down about how we were going to deliver um, that sculpture and what the build method was going to be, what materials we needed. And it just, it became bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden we were ordering 64 tons of decomposed granite earth, building multi-ton steel frames that were going to ballast, that were going to be the structure under it. Um, talking with uh, people from properties around Sydney to try and find an appropriate tree stump, uh, researching how we were going to... This, this tree stump though, but I mean that, that came from Bundanon, didn't it? It did come from Bundanon in the end, yeah. 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 And also I remember like talking with um, Vajiko, I mean he's been incredibly gracious and patient because you know, having to think about three or four different artworks that you're going to make because the site changes or, you know, other things shift. I mean, these were also tombstones. So, I mean, I mean, would it be fair to say, looking at my finger here, is that about six foot here? It's quite yeah. big, isn't about it? That. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, it's, it's and they're, yeah. They're tombstones that have been cut as well. Um, we lost those too. We actually had to make all those. So those are cast out in the island, we concrete cast them, and then we had to break them and crack them. So there's just so many moving parts to this, this particular install. It was, it, was, it, was, it was the longest build period, along with Eric's, I suppose. But this, there were so many tried, unte untested sort of techniques. I mean, we ended up getting a guy, Tony, to come and manage the round earth side of things because Ed couldn't do it. Um, and he basically, when he took the, the, the uh, form work off on the angle, he was kind of, he sort of said to me jokingly, oh, well, at least it's standing up. And I, I, had, I thought they had complete confidence it was going to stand up. <laughs> but really like, you know, pushing the boundaries of, of what could be done on that, I think. I'll, I'll let Jeremy talk now. He's got the steel frame in the background. So. Yeah, so you'll see here that this is, um, this is the beginning of the steel, the, the steel frame that the whole thing is built around. Um, so we put up form work around the interior side around the on the insides and then put up um cantilever like overhung uh formwork on the outside to create the um the angle of the outside of the sculpture and then just built up and rammed earth with pneumatic ram as tony and his his crew really really nailed really nailed it um and yeah i mean that's not actually the finished got the finished frame there was multiple other elements and re um, reinforcement bars and wood everywhere. I think as well, something to mention is that Vagico, you know, was super involved throughout the whole process as well. So it was a huge, you know, amount of um, back and forth as all these elements came together and he was very um, insistent, which is excellent on, you know, we were in touch with tombstone makers working out how they usually make them. We got the plates, you know, the plates were made by a tombstone by someone who usually usually does that so um and and Vagico is very much you know involved in that process and very specific about what he wants which i think you can really see in the final work how much his you know initial vision and although the project did change a few times i think that it really showed in the end that how much work he had yet yeah, put into that yeah i think also just about he, he wasn't in, he was only in a, only in sydney for like three or four days at the end like all of that was done through mm -hmm. whatsapp and email overnight mm -hmm. so i know that you and and sarah and particularly particularly did had so much communication flow with him but outside of normal hours so you're working really long hours and then communicating through the night as well to get sending photos back and forth it's really it's a really difficult way to work but but it, it, it did work in this instance i mean we're also like i mean here's an example of a fantastic work out at Campbelltown. Just, um, just wondering if you wanted to have a chat about um, the kind of working in the kind of the public space as well out there. Um, I probably yeah. So this is Musa's work, and I think um, we were lucky to get to. He's a young South African artist who makes these wonderful works about sort of South African youth culture but in this you know in a way that youth is not normally portrayed and not at all stereotyping and often comparing the way bodies in protest and in celebration and dance are kind of comparable um but um over at Campbelltown we had the opportunity to, to display them outside I wasn't really involved in that installation I don't know if any Alex might be able to talk to that 
Yeah, I, I mean, well, the interesting thing about this one, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> Alex, but I mean, the, this, I mean, it was just also about getting stuff outside as much as we could. Um, and Musa's work, I mean, you know, it's, it was also at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And in fact, we're, we're two, you know, large, um, you know, prints, uh, and also then Barbara McGrady had three large prints. So, like, Musa's work really was the entrance to the old court galleries. And Belle, that's something that, you know, I know that you work closely with too, with, uh, with myself and also the team there. Yeah, so, so going back to, yeah, I, I remember, Brooke, you always really want to have like public facing moments where, where you could and Campbelltown, they were always really open to that. Adam and Michael out there, they were always like, oh, we've got, a, we've got all this like outdoor space. We can use these kind of billboard spaces. And, and that's where that kind of idea came off to have kind of mural size, large, like powerful kind of images. Um, and it did change a few different times, I think, because they're run, they're they're a kind of council. They're run by the council, so I had had to go through various different approval processes, um, and some of the sites be, needed a kind of engineering sign off. And this was what was decided in the end uh, with these three images. Um, I mean, I think that's the really interesting thing about um, sign off. You know, and the kind of the game that we're all playing that is behind the scenes. I know that Anders Sunner's work, you know, the um, the artist, uh, the, the Sami artist who um, did an extraordinary mural at Campbelltown was actually going to be in, in the city of Campbelltown, you know, and you were talking about those sign-offs as well. And so it's really kind of like this little bit of a game too. So, you know, the artists have been really generous with their time. They want to kind of do work, but it's also about this kind of difficult processes of making work, doing a lot of highly, you know, kind of commissioned works as well for this kind of Biennale, um, very much artist driven. And I'm just wondering if, if um, you know, maybe we're coming to an end now um, to the conversation, if um, all of you could maybe just talk about what it meant for you to kind of see things being artist driven or, you know, had it, had it shifted? What does that mean, Tim? Um. I, I suppose I've always worked very closely with artists to realise what they, what they need and what they want and been involved in that collaborative process. But it was definitely more prevalent in this Biennale than, than before. And um, in some ways, it's, it's different. Everyone works in a different way. Sometimes, you know, I'm not going to lie, sometimes it can be quite frustrating the way some, some, people's, some, the way some people approach works. But in some ways, sometimes it can be like completely joyous and you get amazing results. But it is part of why I do this job. I think why most of us do this job because that creative process is the most exciting part of it. And it's, yeah, it's just great to be a part of it and work in such an interesting place. Alex? Um, yeah, so, so my back, you know, my background book, but I, but I also kind of work with artists really closely for know, over five years. Um, but yeah, I think, I think with this Biennale, yeah, it was because of the kind of, the kind of, diverse groups of artists that you selected probably only half I'm, I was trying to think about it the other day probably only half have commercial representation so that that can kind of be kind of a, both an asset and a liability um, in terms of commercial galleries are great because then they can you know provide additional support in terms of kind of logistics and documentation and admin support but kind of on this finale we a lot of the time we we're just talking directly to our artists um, most of the time. And that means we could kind of ship things more flexibly. I mean, not only international, but also domestically, like we were dealing with kind of regional art centers, um, working really closely with, with all them, all the artists as well. So I think that that was kind of what was really good about this edition. Mm. Yeah, I found um, the, I really enjoy the problem solving um, of working with artists. You know, artists come with a concept um, I mean, I'm, right now, I guess I'm specifically speaking to um, new commissions and sculptural works that are kind of being designed, more site-specific stuff, um, because there were a lot of them out at Cockatoo Island this year. Um, I really enjoy working with artists to come from concept to realisation on the ground. Um, you know, working in production, it's kind of the nexus of, you know, trying to realise a creative vision, um, balancing that with the logistical budgetary kind of engineering and regulatory concerns. Um, and as a 
balancing all those things together and working with an artist, every artist has their own way of working. Some people are more outcome driven and that's good. That's done. Or if it's a video work, it's already done. You just got to put it up the right way. Other people are really process driven. Um, and I think that it's just a, it's a real honor to be part of that creative process. And, you know, sometimes you really got to take a back seat with artists and let them work their own way. Other times you really need to step up and, give solutions because people are looking for some solutions to how to realize their concept. And that's the expertise that, you know, different people from the Biennale staff have different expertise that bring in that work with the artist to create the work. Um, and yeah, it was excellent. Love working with all the artists. You know, there were a number of people who spent a lot of time on Cockatoo this year, especially Eric Bridgman. I didn't mention that earlier, but Eric Bridgman was out there the whole time and he was just, um, it was excellent to have him around as a, permanent fixture on the island just like to just sort of say as well the other the other element that comes in is the the amazingly skilled installers and fabricators who we bring on board who run the workshop and a lot of them end up taking a lot of the projects and sort of working even more closely with the artists than we do in production and some of the insight knowledge and skills that they bring are just second to none and there's no way we could do it without the amazingly skilled team that, that come on board definitely um, for the for the long install it is it's like two and a half month installed out here Absolutely. I know that Jean, I think Elisa was like so wrapped, like she's like over the moon. She hasn't been in a Biennale before. Um, you know, she hasn't worked to this scale or level before. And I don't know that she was just so wrapped working with all of the, you know, fabricators and store. I know that all the artists were. Mm. Yeah, no, they did an amazing job. I can't thank them enough. Um, we're really lucky, so lucky to have had the, the amazing sport we had on this build. Yeah, seconded. Maya, um, yeah, I think with your vision for Niran Brook, um, so many of the things that um, you and the artists had discussed or were proposing were really radical or, you know, broke all the rules in the books. And I think that um, the way that you work really closely with the artists and were constantly in contact and having discussions and then involving the team as, it, as things went along, I think that that really made so many things possible and um you know to take opportunities or see things that could happen you know in that moment and um having the close conversations with the artists really yeah i think got a lot of those things uh, realized in the end so i think yeah it was an amazing experience and privilege to work with so many artists and to see their voice at the forefront of, of niran and niran as a platform for artist voices and um, yeah, I, I would definitely second um, what Belle was saying about, you know, this amazing provocation that Niran provided to artists. I think there wasn't this sharp line between, um, you know, existing work and newly commissioned work. And as Brooke said, there were so many sort of new works. And that's because people really took the opportunity to expand on works or to create new things or really adapt them to the site. Um, you know, people like Artri Nepal, I think that originally started out as, you know, possibly just a video work, then became this really amazing comprehensive installation. And they started making these thousands of tiny gold sculptures, which we saw inside one day. And, you know, that became such a big part of the work. And I think that happened just time and time again, where people expanded and, and we did as well, um, you know, massive credit to Stuart and Trent, who I think I told originally that our little book was going to be about 200 pages and it ended up as, you know, far, far, far beyond that with, you know, over 50 people in it. So I think every, everyone was very generous to accommodate people's expanding visions and this desire to really treat Niran as this provocation. Well, I just want to thank you all and, and of course Cherie, um, who's the head of exhibitions and all of everyone who's involved the whole way. Um, and it's so great to hear from you all. And thank you for taking the time today. It's really great. And I hope to see you all again when we open. I've got my fingers crossed. Okay. Hey. Right. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Brooke. Right. Thanks, Brooke. Ciao.